Hello and welcome to today's event organised by the International Platform of Insects for Food and Feed, otherwise known as IPIF. My name is Natasha Foote, I am an agri-food and health journalist with Euractiv, and I have the pleasure of moderating this event on improving soil health and fertility through insect grass application. So when I first heard about this conference, I was pretty intrigued about this concept of FRAS. It's certainly one of the more original themes of events that I have moderated. Um, and while at first glance, perhaps insect FRAS or larvae feces produced as a byproduct of insect farming maybe doesn't seem so appealing or especially interesting, but actually this byproduct holds great potential to be upcycled as a fertilizing product such as an organic fertilizer, compost material, or a soil improver. So in addition to its interesting nutrient profile, this product contains certain beneficial bacteria, which helps encourage plant growth by improving plant health and facilitating their absorption of nutrients. All of this from a byproduct, which also makes it perfectly in line with the principles of a circular economy, all while offering sustainable solutions to European farmers and gardeners. So it may be something that is worth making a buzz about. So a quick overview of today's event before we get stuck in. So we have with us today a number of distinguished speakers from commission officials to industry experts. Uh, we'll kick off with a keynote address followed by a quick round of icebreaker questions to get us all warmed up before delving into the nitty gritty of this conference. Also, let me just remind everyone that this conference is interactive. That means you welcome questions from you watching. Um, you can do so by going on Slido and using the hashtag closing the loop. So after you insert the hashtag closing the loop, you have the possibility to, to submit your question in the Q&A tab. To have your question validated, please do also include your name and your affiliation. And once you complete these steps, click on send and the question will appear on screen. You can also upvote questions that others have proposed if you especially like them. And you can also access polls via Slido, which is perfect as we have a couple of icebreakers coming up. But before we get into that, let me first pass the floor to Antoine Hubert, uh, which is the IPIF outgoing president, but only just, and he will say a few words. So Antoine, the floor is yours. Zero pollution for healthier people and planet is the theme of this year's EU Green Week. And since this workshop is also a Green Week partner event, the intervention of presentation today will stress the importance of facilitating the transition towards circular business models in agriculture in view of improving soil health and fertility, while also reducing pollution and its negative effects on soil. Why is circular agriculture important in reducing soil pollution? How can insect farmers and the insect production chain contribute to tackling these challenges? How can insect frost become one of the solutions to improving soil health and fertility? We will try to answer some of these questions during this event, and we will hear from honorable officials of the European institutions, as well as reputable representatives of key stakeholder associations we have relevant expertise in agriculture, fertilizers, and soil health. We will cover first, then, the importance of soil and the related challenges. Despite all our achievements, we owe our existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. As a soil scientist as background, I couldn't personally agree more with this quote. Problems to solve biodiversity loss, contamination and degradation do not recognize political and geographical borders and may pose major threats to our natural ecosystems and food production systems. Soil is a fundamental resource for our planet's biodiversity. Its ecological interactions and scientific evidence indicates that healthy soils contribute to mitigating climate change by storing soil organic carbon. Then we will look today how insect frass is one of the solutions. Recent scientific evidence confirms indeed the added value of insect frass, which improves plant growth and resistance to stress, soil health and fertility. In addition, numerous farms in some parts of EU have already incorporated insect frass in their fertilization strategies, using it in crop production, orchard or vineyards. It is where 
uh, we strongly believe that the European insect sector could help to improve soil fertility thanks to a process that is 100% circular and sustainable insect farming. The valorization of FRAS uh, as organic fertilizer also generates complementary revenues for insect producers, thereby contributing to support the growth and the competitiveness of the sector which is, in our view, will become a relevant link in EU's agri-food chain by the end of this decade. Finally, some concluding elements uh, on EU legislation. In the past few years, IPF worked closely with the European Commission and the EU member states to develop a level playing field for insect frost across the EU, with the view to offer more local opportunities to European farmers and insect producers. The recent agreements reached by the EU member states just uh, last week that aims at setting EU-wide standards for the valorization of insect frass as a fertilizer constitutes a major progress for our sector. We believe that these harmonized norms reflect the scientific evidence with respect to some of the key nutritional properties of frass. On the IPF side, we are committed to keeping an open and constructive dialogue with the European Union institutions and national authorities exploring uh, the possibilities to maximize the contribution of insect frost to EU farm to fork objectives, uh, including with respect to the EU uh, farm to fork target of 25% organic agricultural land by 2030. Uh, our speakers today will tell you more about this subject. Uh, and a very few last, word to, few last words today, as uh, this is my last speech as IPF president after six years and two mandates uh, since IPF inception. I would like to thank IPF and all my colleagues, insect producer for the great journey, and all European institutions I have been meeting in the past few years. Almost 10 years since the first discussions at FAO summit in January 2012, where IPF embryo was drafted. We can be very proud regarding all what has been built in this decade. Several new markets opened in Europe, an association with about 80 members today, several technical guidelines published, several high-level events like this one organized, and also the inception of a global insect alliance. All of this is positioning now and more than ever IPF as a key actor among European stakeholders. I will personally continue to support the sector, of course, and uh, as IPF uh, Vice President. I wish to personally thank the speakers and panelists and each uh, and every one of you today uh, for joining us uh, here in this event, virtual event, and I'm confident that we will have a constructive dialogue, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future and future IPF events and hopefully in person. All the best. Thank you very much for those words, Antoine, kicking us off today and giving a, a, a great overview introduction there for us. So um, as I mentioned in my introduction, we will now be turning to Slido for a couple of icebreakers. Um, and so I would ask you all to, to make sure that you have Slido up on your screen. Uh, well, firstly, I would like to hear from all of you watching uh, in one word. How would you describe your expectations ahead of this workshop? So I'll give you, I'll give you a moment to, to give your description. Okay, we've got several words coming in there. I can see them. There we go. So what do we have here? Insights, update, innovative, informative. Uh, these are the biggest words I can see, or oh, they're changing every minute. <laughs> um, learning, market, new, growth, technical requirements, sustainability, inspiration, development, exciting. Okay, so these are these are all uh, really positive words I can see here. So I can see we're all quite excited for, for what is to come. So thank you for this word cloud. And now we'll just have one more just to get everyone warmed up. Um, so on a scale of one to five, um, to what what extent do you understand the topic of Frass. We've got here one grass, <laughs> grass, I suppose, grass or frass, grass or frass. Um, and number five being expert knowledge. So please do rank your understanding of the subject before the event. We'll see how this changes perhaps after the event. Let's have a look. Okay, so we're kind of in the middle, middle zone here. Um, we're hoping all well, the threes will move up to, to fives by the end. <laughs> Anyone who was one or two, we definitely want you in the higher category by the end of the event, but actually it's quite a nice spread. So we're hoping that there'll be 
or definitely designed the conference so that there's something for everyone here. So, you know, whether you're a one or a five, hopefully you will take something away from today's event. So thank you very much for those. And I would now like to welcome to the floor Matthias Klemencic, he's a policy officer at the European Commission DigiSanti, who's going to get the ball rolling today with a keynote speech focusing on the regulatory status of insect frass, uh, followed by a short Q&A session. So make sure to start sending in your questions. Matthias, the floor is yours. Uh, I wish you all uh, a nice afternoon and uh, I would like to thank you for your invitation to this event. It is a real pleasure to be a keynote speaker and at the same time it is also uh, for me as a uh, an official uh, to very nice to see and hear uh, opinion from the industry. So this is big exchange. It is two way uh, event. So um, I would like to now ask you to open uh, my presentation that I can present it uh, on the screen. Um, it's going on. Yes, very nice. So uh, before um, I will present you the latest legislative developments in the uh, uh, in the sector as regards insects for us, I would uh, actually start with the presentation of an overview of the regulatory context that uh, we can actually uh, understand uh, why we are doing uh, certain steps in this procedure and uh, how actually can uh, insects be uh, uh, understand within the European legislation. So I would kindly ask you to start the first slide. Indeed. Uh, so, um, we must start at the beginning and whenever we discuss about live animals, about uh, animal products, uh, about anything in the sector of animal health, we should always start with regulation uh, uh, EU 2016 4-9, which is animal health law. And uh, you can find insects in the definitions of Article 4. First of all, insects are animals, uh, so they are subject to the animal health law. And then um, uh, when you will searching for another definition, you will see that insects are actually uh, mentioned under other animals. Uh, so they are not uh, in the definition of terrestrial or aquatic animals, but other animals. So this is very important to understand all uh, subsequent uh, delegated and implementing acts, which regulate animal health status of particular animal species. So if you now continue with uh, the next slide, um, we come into the area of animal byproducts regulation, which actually regulate or products of animal origin, which are not intended for human consumption. So when you actually place on the market insects for human consumption, they are outside of the scope of ABP legislation and are subject to food hygiene legislation. While uh, when you do whatever with insects intended for feeding of farm animals or in our particular case with frass, then you are within the scope of animal byproducts legislation. So it's very important to understand the difference between raw and process uh, animal byproducts. Uh, and then you will find actually definition of insects within the farmed animals. So whatever in this legislation applies to farmed animals, then it's applied automatically also to insects. Then we will continue with the next slides where I will show you actually a little bit more on uh, the substance. So now we are already getting into the implementing regulation uh, 142 slash 2011, which actually set up the real rules for um, particular activities of operators. So in, in the first place, um, I would draw your attention to processing methods. So any derived product needs to be processed accordingly to the category uh, of uh, this product and according to the processing method designed for a particular product. So when you produce insects for feed, uh, you are subject to Annex 10, which set up standards for the production of feed of animal origin for farmed animals. Uh, then uh, with the our amendment, uh, you will also enter into the Annex 11, which is on uh, organic fertilizers and soil improvers. And at the end of the day, uh, a lot of insect industry is involved also in Annex uh, 13, which sets standards on pet food. 
And it's very also important for you, uh, also conditions for imports, which are set up in Annex 14 and 15. But if I can continue with the Commission Regulation 1, uh, 2017, uh, 893, uh, which actually introduced insects into the animal byproducts legislation. So this is a very comprehensive uh, act, which uh, revised two different legal aspects. So first of all, the BSETSC legislation, which actually set up a list of authorized materials of animal origin for feeding of farmed animals. And uh, at the same time, we also set up standards for breeding of insects, for feeding of insects, and uh, the last also standards for import of insects, processed protein from third countries. So I would say very comprehensive act. And um, once we actually introduce insects, then we recognize that we need also the next step, which is actually a subject of our discussion uh, during today's presentation. So we actually regulated everything about live insects, about feeding, but the missing part was actually what to do with the excrements of insects with frass. And now we continue with the next slide. So following a request of insects industry uh, for harmonization of uh, insects frass, uh, actually, uh, the Commission uh, started its, uh, its uh, role in this area. So we discussed the issue with um, um, stakeholders, with all stakeholders, in particular also with uh, member states, and uh, actually uh, launched uh, a discussion on draft Commission regulation, amending certain annexes to regulation uh, 142-2011. This is the implementing regulation as regards placing on the market of certain insects product. So it was a legal vehicle also for some other amendments, but actually you will see that uh, this uh, draft, which is for the time being still at the uh, stage of draft because it was only presented and voted in favor by member states. Uh, but uh, there are still some further um, comitology uh, phases. So for the time being, it's presented to the council and to the parliament for their scrutiny. So this draft uh, will introduce several missing parts on uh, use of FRAS and on placing on FRAS on the market. So if you continue to the next slide, we will see that uh, uh, whenever we do anything, the next slide, yes, thank you, we need a definition. Uh, so with the introduction of definition, everybody exactly know what we are discussing. And uh, you can see that uh, for the purpose of the animal byproducts legislation, FRAS means a mixture of excrements derived from farm insects, their feeding substrate parts of farm insects, ZX, and with a, a contact of farm insects, which is not higher than 5% in volume and not more than 3% in weight. So this definition was subject to very um, difficult negotiation with member states to agree on, on the on the definition. Uh, in particular, member states uh, expressed their concerns about escape of uh, insects uh, through the frass into the environment. And for that reason, we have uh, very, very, very strict conditions for the manufacturing of frass and placing on the market. So if you go to the next slide, actually, after definition, uh, we come to the core of our discussion. This is now discussion about Annex 11, which is actually Annex on, uh, on organic fertilizer and soil improvers. And uh, if you see, we had to actually fix uh, the missing gap in the legislation. And uh, we introduce actually now FRAS into the legislation. So, in front of you is slide with very raw uh, uh, text, uh, which actually 
doesn't say anything. Uh, but uh, if I translate you in a common language, uh, so now we align standards for placing on the market of RAS with existing standards for the placing on the market of process manure. So once uh, a manure is subject to a processing for uh, 70 degrees for 60 minutes, so it's become uh, actually, it uh, reached the status of process manure, and then it is placed on the market uh, uh, within the European Union. So with this, um, with this uh, amendment, actually when it will be adopted, uh, you will get opportunity to trade with your product all over the European Union. So if you continue also to the next slide, uh, even though this is not the subject of today's discussion, I would like to mention that um, the exactly the same amendment actually introduced also an opportunity to use a silkworm for the production of uh, processed animal protein. And um, of course, also uh, any leftovers of silk worm may be used uh, in the manufacturing of frass and placing on the market. But now we will continue to the next slide, which is very important. Uh, it is the next one. Uh, that was jump. Yes, exactly this one. Yes, thank you very much. So in uh, the same uh, legal package, uh, we provide also for a transitional uh, period of 12 months after the publication. Why? This uh, draft uh, actually introduced standardization, actually harmonization of FRAS and harmonized rules for placing on the EU market. For the time being, uh, certain operators in some member states are allowed to use some other standards and those harmonize. However, uh, they cannot actually adjust their standards to the harmonized standards over the night. And this is uh, actually very normal uh, part of uh, harmonization that uh, for those who are not able to do over the night, we actually offer uh, certain transitional period to align their procedures, their actually technical details of their manufacturing uh, with the new harmonized requirements. So at that point, um, actually, uh, I would say that this is a short presentation of what we have done, but uh, I would say that there is still uh, some uh, still some job for the future. Uh, in particular, uh, you don't see in this draft uh, any rules on imports of RAS from third countries. I can explain this. So there is no rules because uh, member states ask uh, for very stepwise approach. And uh, we actually address this uh, with uh, first, with a period uh, when we will monitor actually trade in FRAS and learn if there is anything uh, problematic in this uh, new product on the market. And once uh, member states will be, let's say, um, satisfied with the results of this uh, period, we will then continue also uh, with rules, uh, with a setting of rules for imports of FRAS from third countries. So for the time being, it is only uh, foreseen to have rules for placing on the EU market, so for intra-EU trade, while we are still waiting uh, uh, for the results of uh, this exercise to see if it is appropriate to continue and allow also imports from third countries. So just for your information, uh, it will not be authorization from any third countries, but most probably only from third countries which are authorized already for the imports of processed protein of insects origin. So, uh, I think that uh, this is in uh, short uh, my presentation, and I would be also very uh, uh, happy to, to uh, actually clarify uh, any open questions. I've been told that there will be some questions, and uh, I propose that we continue with this part of my presentation. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Matthias. That was very comprehensive. Um, so we will move to a few questions now. And let me just remind everyone before we do um, to please still uh, continue submitting questions. But when you do, please do specify your name and your affiliation and also keep your questions nice and concise so we can fit in as many as possible. Um, so Matthias, I have a couple of questions for you to kick off um, firstly. The first question I'm wondering is, do you foresee the possibility of having a more kind of tailored processing uh, methods with, rega with regards to insect frass in the near future? For example, applications of uh, lower temperatures, temperatures lower than 70 degrees. What would be your reaction there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for this question. Indeed, um, uh, the uh, legislative framework definitely allow such discussion and uh, it is completely up to um, uh, to, to your intentions in the future. So uh, in the legislation, we already foreseen uh, a revision and amendments of existing norms. So I, I should go now a short step back in the, in the history. So all existing standards, uh, what I presented to you and what I referred before, uh, based on the 2015 EFSA, uh, scientific opinion on the risk profile related to the production and consumption of, of insects as food and feed. So uh, if you wish to have some another standards, you need to prepare a file uh, for the EFSA risk assessment. And in case that, um, uh, in case of a favorable, favorable assessment, we will definitely take it into account and introduce into the legislation. So it is everything uh, up to the risk assessment of the European Food Safety Authority. Thank you for that. And I want just to push a little bit more on these tailored standards. I'm wondering, with the establishment of tailored standards, um, such as setting kind of an endpoint under the EU ABP legislation, facilitate market and trade of insect frass as fertilizer across and in between EU countries? Yes. Um, when you will start uh, um, trade in France, uh, you will be still subject to the uh, to the official control regulation. So uh, there will be requirements for a commercial document for uh, distribution between uh, authorized, uh, approved, and registered uh, places according to the EVP legislation. So indeed, it will be trade, but not completely, uh, let's say, free trade. So a lot of controls. And uh, actually objective of such tailor-made standards for insects were definitely uh, aiming in the setting of endpoints. So when you start uh, your internal discussion on harmonized, on uh, tailor-made standards, you must do it in a view of endpoint because once a uh, fertilizer reached the endpoint in the manufacturing chain of animal byproducts regulation, so there is no more official controls by animal health authorities. And the whole product actually move into the fertilizer regulation area. So you will benefit uh, less controls uh, when a product is defined as endpoint, and then you really uh, trade only under one single uh, legal framework instead of uh, several uh, legal frameworks. Uh, what will be the situation once this draft on FRAS will be adopted. Great, okay, we're going to now um, have a little look at some of the questions from the participants on Slido to see uh, what their questions are. Let's just get that up on the screen. Okay, so we have a question uh, that's been the most upvoted question is from John. Um, he says he's a free agent. Um, so, um, will the frass generated after feeding lower quality waste streams, uh, for example, manure or sewage slurry, be treated in the same regards to application or is there exclusion from this? Uh, so, um... If I understand correctly, you refer to two different uh, uh, products. So definitely we discuss uh, within this draft, uh, which I presented only the manure. So it is not on a uh, sewage uh, slurry. So um, we discuss the manure of insects and this is the subject of discussion. While the sewage slurry uh, actually um, we need to a uh, definition and translation into the animal byproduct language. 
so if this is still part of the uh, collection of manure on farm, then yes, but if it is a uh, waste operation, then it is already subject to the waste legislation. Okay, and let's have a look at the uh, second question we have here. The question here from Sarah, who's a researcher in entomology. Um, she'd like to know, why is the quantity of dead insects limited in Fras? I was also wondering the same thing in your presentation when you said it was limited uh, to the percentage. Perhaps you could expand a little bit on that for us. Uh, yes, I can explain. Um, so um, the main risk, uh, which is uh, which is posed by for us, is actually escape of insects into environment. And mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, present um, um, a matrix for the heat treatment, uh, there are some rules uh, how to heat treat it. Uh, and if you have a high number of live insects inside. Uh, then uh, some of those uh, survive. So that is almost impossible to say which larvae is dead or uh, life in the, in the uh, frass. For that reasons, we simply just uh, limited the quantity of dead insects to exclude live insects, which uh, by coincidence survive there. And with this reduction, we actually mitigate the risk that uh, at the end of the day, any live uh, insects uh, actually be released in the environment. I hope mm -hmm. that clarified. I think that clarifies the situation. Thank you very much. We'll take a couple more questions now. Let's have a look. Um, our next question from uh, from Shan, is that? Is that that question? Um, sorry, let me just get that on the screen. There we go, I can see it now. Okay, we have a question here from Shan. Uh, what about frass obtained from insects reared on food waste? That's a good question. Food waste is obviously an enormous problem. Um, uh, is there any specific regulation available regarding this, regarding substrate? Do you consider substrate when you're considering um, frass? So as far as, as far as I am aware uh, in European Union, we cannot uh, actually rear insects on food waste. Right. So okay. maybe uh, this is a question from a participant from a third country. And uh, when uh, we will set up rules for import of frass from third countries, we will also address this issue. For the time okay. being, so it's something that maybe for the future that you would look to, to include. Exactly. Right, okay. Excellent, thank you. Let's have a little look and see if there's any other questions I can pick from. Um, okay, we have a top question now, it's an anonymous question. I can't see it yet. Yes, I can. Uh, anonymous question. Can frass be, imp I think you've answered this question potentially. Can frass be imported from a third country? If so, which regulation defines the countries from which the frass may come? I think you may have answered that question, but perhaps you could just specify that. Yeah, um, so uh, frass currently cannot be imported from third countries. And when uh, there will be rules, it will be actually set up uh, within the framework of the ABP legislation. So it will be another amendment of the regulation uh, 111, uh, 142. Excellent, thank you. Very precise answer, much appreciated. Let's take one more question uh, before we move to our coffee break. We have one here from Jakob Ig Egan's Black said, sorry, that was a terrible pronunciation, um, who has a master's in biotechnology. Um, and Jakob would like to know, do you think it could be allowed if it was proved to be safe to accept untreated frass, so not heat treated, um, to keep the microbiota in the frass intact? I think I said as in my introduction that the microbiology was also an important component of frass. So is that something that you foresee being, being possible at some point in the future? Yeah, I understand the question. Uh, so. Um the microbiology, uh, microbiology of RAS is very important. However, in the current uh, discussion, there is no room for such uh, option. So it should be treated. Okay, very, very, uh, very specific answer. Thank you very much. And um, so I think now we will move to a, a short 15 minute break. So it's just time to grab yourself a coffee or a cup of tea if you have British tendencies like me. And we will see you all back here at 3.30 to kick off with our panel discussions. Thank you very much, Matthias, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello and welcome back. I hope you're all refreshed and ready and raring to get back to this event today. Um, just a quick reminder before we get stuck in uh, to remember to keep submit, submitting your questions via Slido uh, throughout the event for our panellists. And when asking your questions, please do keep them precise and please make sure uh, you specify your name and your affiliation and also to address which speaker the question is for so that it can best be answered. So without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker today. That's Chloe Fan, Fan v, v, um, a mouthful, sorry there, um, who is IPIF, an executive committee member in charge of circularity and also the keynote panelist today, who will give a short presentation before we move to today's panel discussion. So Chloe, the floor is yours. Discussion, so Chloe, the floor is yours. Thanks, Natasha, and uh, hi, everyone. Very happy to be able to tell you a bit more about the, the FRAS. Um, and Natasha, will be, you be able to pull up the, the presentation? Great. Um, and so uh, I have 15 minutes now to tell you a bit more about what is um, insect frass. And so we'll be talking about four things mainly today. Um, the, the first one is what is insect frass, obviously, and getting a bit more into the details about uh, what is in this, uh, in this uh, new um, fertilizer. Um, the second thing we'll be touching more about the circularity potential of insect frass as we are on a, on a workshop about closing the loop. So talking about like which loops uh, we are aiming at, at, at closing. Um, and then um, I'd like to, to, to touch on uh, IPF contribution on the, uh, to the EU policy discussions. And I think it's, a, it's important also to uh, have the, the, uh, the inputs from operators on the, on the ground. And uh, we have now in, in Europe quite a few uh, insect producers that have had um, some, um, uh, op uh, that, that, that have had operations for, for the last few years. And so I have also a lot of, uh, of data um, on, uh, on the frass, uh, its um, potential and, um, uh, and uh, the, the way it's, uh, it's produced. Um, and last but not least, we're still at the, the, the beginning of the journey, as Mr. Klemenczyk was saying uh, about the, the defining the, the regulatory framework for, for the for the FRAS. Um, and we'd like to discuss um, uh, what uh, IP things uh, should come uh, next. So if we deep dive into what is insect frass, so um, the, the frass is a byproduct of uh, insect production. Uh, it consists of insect uh, larvae feces. Um, and so the way it's obtained is that uh, in insect farms, insects are farmed in, in vertical farms uh, on mattresses. And at the end of the uh, breeding period, these mattresses are sieved so that on the one hand, uh, you have the insects and on the other hand, you have the frass, which are the dejections. So the larvae are separated uh, in, the, in the process from the, uh, from the dejection. Um, and uh, you then get the frass, uh, which is um, free from most of the larvae. It's impossible to completely remove uh, all, all the larvae. So there are still some larvae that, uh, that, that remains um, that are then uh, killed in a, a, during the, the, the processing uh, and so the heating treatment. So there will be in the frass then no live uh, larvae. Um, I would not touch again on the, the legal definition, as I think Mr. Clementing was quite comprehensive on, uh, on this. Um, but then in terms of what it contains, the frass uh, has a very high content of um, organic matter, so around like 75%, which makes it um, quite high when you compare it to other manure, uh, where it's uh, potentially around like 60-ish uh, percent. Um, so it's very high in terms of uh, organic matter. Um, and has uh, a lot of uh, beneficial bacteria um, that uh, will then uh, um, stimulate uh, soil's, uh, soil's health. Um, and have uh, the frass also has an interesting NPK profile, so um, that uh, that enables it as well to boost uh, plant and soil uh, health. 
in terms of uh, the, the, the production of the, the frass today, we are around um, a, a few uh, thousand tons, um, but we'll be growing quite quickly as the insect sector, especially in Europe, uh, is growing strongly uh, to respond to the demand. And it's expected that uh, in the next few years, by the mid 2020s, um, it will reach um, 1.5 million tons. Um, and, uh, and finally, in terms of um, other um, components of the, the FRAS, what has been uh, demonstrated in um, uh, a lot of research articles that have been published and uh, operations and trials that have been done by the different uh, operators um, is the high concentration um, of uh, nutrients and micronutrients, and in particular chitin, uh, that will uh, stimulate uh, soil health health and um, boost the immune response, the natural immune response of, uh, of plants. If we then go into the, the circularity potential of, um, of insect frass, um, I think the, 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 the we need once we need to come back uh, to the the circularity potential of uh, the insect sector uh, more more generally with this ability to upcycle um, local available agricultural byproducts. So we're talking about brand solubles with brand with solubles, for instance, um, to upcycle these uh, byproducts uh, and uh, by feeding them to insects, being able to extract the nutrients either in the form of insects that are then uh, used as food or as feed, uh, or uh, as uh, the frass, so the dejection, um, that are then returned to the soils that are then going to give the byproducts that are then going to be fed to uh, the, the insects. And in this sense, uh, thanks to the frass, uh, the insect industry is able to close the nitrogen loop and uh, bringing back nitrogen into the soils. Um, uh, and, uh, and in this sense, uh, the, the insect farming is, a, is, is based on a circular, um, circular model. Insects for us also has a, a, a huge potential to, uh, as an organic fertilizer, um, to respond to the needs of uh, European farmers. Uh, and on this, it's, uh, I think it has a, a key role to play in, the, uh, in, in Europe's farm to fork strategy. Uh, this is outlined that uh, by 2030, so it's coming up quite soon, 25% of, agri uh, of uh, agricultural lands should be organic. Um, and in this sense, we'll need uh, organic fertilizer that are able to both, uh, to both boost uh, plant health and growth, but also uh, sustainably uh, um, uh, improve soil health. And if we move on to uh, the contribution of IPIF um, to uh, the, the regulatory discussions that's been taking place at the, the EU level to develop the right framework, um, if we, if to give you a bit of background, um, so IPIF was uh, created more than six years ago, um, and uh, the, the IPIF uh, task force on FRAS um, was uh, created at the beginning of uh, 2019, and it's a task force that is constituted of both operators, so insect producers in Europe, but also um, uh, researchers, um, uh, so that um, we uh, are able to, to work together to bring uh, valuable uh, insights to uh, the, the European Commission. Um, the objective of this, uh, of this task force is to bring the insights from the ground, but also to um, have a, a proactive outreach towards the, the, the European Commission services uh, and ensure um, uh, the, a good dialogue with uh, national competent authorities. So what you can see uh, on the on the right are uh, the different um, uh, outputs that uh, this task force has been working on, um, be it the uh, like, uh, contribution paper that's been submitted to the to the authorities, or um, different meetings have been organised with uh, uh, the, the the different representatives. 
And so if we go back to that uh, uh, recent um, uh, policy uh, development, I think uh, IPF, we think it's a, it's a, a great sign of, uh, uh, of moving forward on, the, on defining this, um, this uh, guidelines for, for, for the FRAS. Um, uh, it was uh, much needed for uh, the different operators to set a level playing field among the different producers across Europe. And so the setup of this baseline heating process standards um, is uh, very, very welcomed. Um, it's a first step. Um, as um, and I think uh, some of you touched on this during the, the questions uh, in the longer run, um, we consider that we would need to uh, uh, develop tailor met requirements um, so that we are able to maximize the potential of the, the FRAS and in particular uh, regarding the, the heating, uh, heating treatments, uh, being able to um, uh, um, maintain a very strict endpoint with absolutely no live larvae um, and uh, um, uh, abide by the threshold that's been set of uh, 3% uh, dead, a uh, maximum of 3% dead larvae in the frass, while in the meantime, uh, ensuring that uh, we keep all the bacteria that have demonstrated the potential on uh, soils, health and uh, uh, plant uh, nutrition. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of the, the or specific remarks on the, which I think is on the next slide, um, uh, regarding the the, the this regulatory, uh, regulatory um, framework. Um, uh, I think uh, what we'll see as, uh, as we uh, implement this, uh, this framework is that first, like I think one thing to, to stress is that uh, all uh, operators on the grounds are committed to um, limit uh, to a maximum uh, the, the, the presence of uh, larvae in the, in the frass. And so we'll abide by the, the 3% having like a specific sieving process and being able to have all the process is in place to uh, demonstrate that uh, the, the presence of uh, dead larvae is, uh, is controlled. Um, however, it's important also to stress that these uh, insects are also uh, the, the presence of uh, a small percentage of insects is also what provides uh, its quality to, uh, to the frass and in particular uh, the, the, the presence of chitin. Um, that is present in the exoskeleton of, uh, of the insects has demonstrated some great impact on, uh, on our soils. Um, and so in terms of uh, what uh, should come next, uh, I think we've um, touched on this uh, a little bit already. Um, I think uh, the, the, to, to the question that was uh, raised a, a bit earlier, um, the ability to uh, develop specific uh, uh, frame, uh, specific regulatory guidelines for the frost um, in the future. So I think it was it was great to uh, to have this level playing field for the different uh, operators with the seventy degrees an hour um, uh, to uh, ensure this level playing field. Um, but in the future. Uh, the, we should consider also developing specific uh, uh, frameworks for, for the FRAS while ensuring um, that, uh, the, uh, the, that we abide by two main things. The first one is uh, strictly controlling the uh, quantity of uh, insects present in the FRAS, which are below the 3% uh, that are uh, set in the, in the guidelines, and also having uh, the, the specific um, sample and, uh, and product analysis so that uh, we can uh, mitigate, mitigate any microbiological or chemical risk um, associated with the production of uh, of insect um, uh, of insect frass, um, but I think uh, one thing that IPF would recommend uh, 
um, uh, to, to all national authority authorities is uh, to authorize the running of failed trials with untreated fras, um, so that uh, while uh, abiding with the two requirements that I just uh, stated, um, uh, we can also evaluate the impact of, uh, of this untreated fras uh, on, on the lens. Um, as uh, uh, removing some of the uh, extreme thermal uh, uh, treatments uh, might also be able to maintain uh, the, the full potential of, uh, of the frass, in particular regarding uh, the, the bacteria that are present in it. In it. And on this, uh, it was just to give you a, a quick overview on, uh, on the FRAS uh, from uh, uh, the IPIF perspective, and uh, I welcome any questions you, you may have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chloe, for that comprehensive overview. And indeed, we will uh, be uh, putting some questions to you from, from the audience but, um, during the next panel session or after the next panel session. Um, so please do keep your questions coming throughout. So let's turn to today's panel discussion. And today we have with us Johanna Berntel, who is Deputy Head of Unit Chemicals and Plastics Industries at DG Grow, at the European Commission's DG Grow. We have Benoit Planck from the European Consortium Consortium of the Organic Based Fertilizer Industry, um, ECOFI. We have Penelope Vantan Sweet, who's a, represent a representative from the European Environmental Bureau. And we welcome back as well Chloe, uh, who we have just, uh, just seen there to the panel. Uh, again, Chloe is the IPIF Executive Committee member in charge of circularity. So to kick us off for this panel discussion, I will firstly turn to each panelist in turn for a short five minute introductory statement and small presentation, introducing themselves, their background, their experience of and views on insect frass as a fertilizing product. product. And so I'll come to Johanna first. Johanna, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks. Uh, thanks for the floor. Uh, thanks a lot to IP for this invitation. I must say uh, I'm learning a lot. I was not at level one uh, in the init initial question. I know the difference between grass and frost, uh, but this is a very new product for us. So it's really uh, informative to be here. Uh, also reading the questions that come in in Slido, I have to say, is very informative for us to understand uh, what, what, what is going on on the ground uh, and what kind of concerns uh, there are. Are my slides up? Because I can't see them myself. Ah, now they are, okay. Um, so this is me, uh, I am uh, Johanna and I work in uh, the Commission's DG Grow, uh, which is uh, in charge, uh, among other things, uh, of the legislation on the internal market and the free movement of products on the internal market. And that's why I'm here today. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and I will um, introduce you to a good friend of mine. Um, okay, I think the image is missing. Yes, voila, now you see the whole slide. Uh, I'd like to in introduce you to a very good friend of mine called the Fertilizing Products Regulation. Uh, it was, man was mentioned already by, by Chloe as the, as the fertilizers legislation in the EU. I also saw a question about it already uh, on the chat. So um, it's, uh, uh, yes, again, so congratulations to, to the colleagues in Digisante and to Matthias for the, for the success of the negotiations under the Animal Byproducts Regulation. Uh, so why do I start talking about another piece of legislation now? Uh, well, it's because the uh, FPR, the Fertilizing Products Regulation, uh, will give, uh, it gives, uh, it will give as of next, next summer, uh, free movement on the internal market to, product, to products that are covered by it and that are compliant with it. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, the FPR was long awaited, I have to say, in particular by uh, manufacturers uh, of products that are not covered by the existing fertilizers regulation. So the existing fertilizers regulation, it gives this free movement on the internal market uh, to um, 
notably mineral fertilizers, uh, but not to organic fertilizers, uh, not to soil improvers, plant biostimulants, growing media, uh, all these more circular products. Uh, and that's why this was, the FPR was an important delivery uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the first uh, circular economy action plan. So manufacturers uh, were very interested, manufacturers of these more alternative fertilizing products were really interested in this uh, regulation. They really asked us for us for it. Um, technology providers are also interested. We can have a very quick look at the next slide, please. Uh, so from our perspective, uh, it's also very beneficial for farmers and for EU citizens because uh, the farmer, farmers uh, get a wider choice of, of products when we open up the single market for them uh, and the citizens get safer products. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, and I want to, want to point out, I mean, with the forthcoming amendments of the animal byproducts regulation, uh, you will always, the, the manufacturers of the insect trust will already have something. They will have a controlled access to national markets. Now, once a product is covered by the FPR, um, it can still have access to national markets uh, with potentially different or even lower standards than the harmonized standards. I saw a question about this in the uh, slide a little while ago. So uh, when it comes to the, uh, uh, the point of view of, of uh, uh, fertilizers legislation, products legislation, not animal byproducts uh, legislation, but fertilizers legislation, the FPR uh, only allows products to comply with the regulation and then have access to the free, to, to the entire single market. Uh, but products that comply with other national pieces of fertilizers legislation can have access to national market. They just will not have access to the uh, entire single market. So the two regulatory systems are not um, uh, mutually exclusive. We can go to the next slide, please. Don't be scared by the two following slides. They are very technical, but what I want to show you only with this is that there are two levels of product rules in the FPR. Um, the first one is something that you're used to seeing. So you have uh, rules that apply to the finalized product and you have the categories of products that you will recognize. So again, fertilizers, uh, lining materials, and also more um, novel uh, products, or at least products that have not been harmonized at EU level in the past. So soil improver, uh, growing media, uh, plant biostimulants, and the organic fertilizers. So that's one level of regulation. But what is more important for, for manufacturers uh, and economic operators in the industry of frost, now we can go to the next slide, what is much more important, because the frost will already find uh, a category in this layer to comply with uh, inorganic fertilizers or uh, growing media, uh, maybe. But if we go to the next slide, uh, and uh, Chloe already mentioned CMC 10. So why? what's a CMC? A CMC is the other level of regulation where we actually regulate the ingredients, the component materials. So CMC stands for component material category. And this is very important for, uh, how shall I say, more, uh, more circular raw materials uh, because a raw material can only be used for a fertilizing product that will comply with the FPR if the raw material is listed uh, in one of these CMCs. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, and I'll just briefly point out which CMCs are pertinent for animal byproducts. Uh, so it's essentially now uh, the, the CMCs for compost, digestate, and uh, products derived from animal byproducts. There will soon be three other CMCs, will, which will also be pertinent for animal byproducts to some extent. But I think these three, five, and ten uh, are the most uh, important ones for the insect trials. So for compost and digestate, as soon as an endpoint has been defined uh, for insect trials as fertilizers under the animal byproducts relation, if it will be, let's see. But I think as soon as an endpoint has been defined under the animal byproducts regulation then insect frost can already have access to the FPR in the form of uh, compost and digestate by virtue of the existing CMCs three and five. Uh, in other forms than compost and digestate, there would need to be an amendment of uh, the one of the CMCs in FPR, and I would expect it to be uh, indeed CMC 10 as 
uh, Chloe already pointed out, um, where uh, we would also explicitly list the insect frost uh, in uh, the CMC 10, and then uh, the products would, containing it would have access to the entire single market. So if you go to my next and concluding slide, uh, I think what I want you to, yes, yeah, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, what I want you to remember uh, is that uh, now already there has been a victory. Uh, there will be a controlled access uh, to the to parts of the EU market by virtue of the animal byproducts regulation. Uh, if you want to scale this up further, uh, go more industrial and uh, have access to uh, the entire single market, uh, which is one of the big successes, I would say, of the EU for economic operators. Remember the fertilizing products regulation. Uh, remember to uh, seek an inclusion of the insects for us also in the fertilizing products regulation um, and contact my, colli my colleagues and I and here you have our uh, email address and we are very interested in this field so thank you very much. Perfect thank you very much Johanna and um, let me now turn to um, Benoit for your uh, introductory statement and your presentation. So Benoit, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot uh, to invite me. So I'm Benoit Planck. Uh, I represent today ECOFIS, uh, European Consortium of the Organic Based Fertilizer, but uh, I'm uh, the Chief Compliance Officer of Elo Nature, a producer of organic based fertilizer. And as uh, Johanna said, it was a long road to have the FPR, but uh, we have it. And, we are proud that uh, next year we can put uh, for the first time uh, EC organic uh, fertilizer. So today uh, the, I will give you some insight from the industry on organic based fertilizer. So if you can go on the next slide, please. Uh, Ecofis so represents the voice of the organic based fertilizer in Europe. We are producer of three main categories that uh, the, uh, this category are defined on the new FPR, so organic fertilizer, organomineral fertilizer, and organic soil improver. Uh, we are mainly active uh, in Europe, uh, in the median area and Middle East, and organic based fertilizer are um, crucial in the Mediterranean country due to the native soil quality, but also due to the clim climatic condition because there is a height degradation of the organic matter of the soil and the bioactivity of the soil. And uh, ECOFI and the organic based fertilizer are dominated by SMEs. So if you can go on the next slide, please. Normally, when we discuss about organic fertilizer, you think about that. Uh, manure in a field, but in fact, if you can go on the next slide, the reality is very different because we are more techniques, we are more uh, advanced in technology because we produce um, organic based fertilizer by mixing different components, but also by integrated some treatment as defined by MATLAS for the uh, hygienization of uh, animal byproducts. So it's a very technology uh, sector as a sector of the production of insects. So if we can go on the next slide, please. The main benefit for the refined organic based fertilizer versus on-farm sources, if I can say. Um, as I said, we use a, a huge variety of raw material. So we have an higher added value on nutrient content. So we are able to, to, to tailor uh, organic fertilizer um, to fit with the needs of the farmer and the soil. We are also safer because as I said, we uh, have some specific rules to uh, treat uh, the product, to decrease uh, and to limit the pathogens. We are also focusing on the level of contaminant uh, like uh, heavy metals, for example. Um, we uh, are also able to maintain and to guarantee traceability from the raw material to the end user. So it's very important uh, for the food uh, 
chain to ensure the traceability of the raw material and to be able, if we have an issue, to uh, manage uh, the issue. And uh, by creating refined organic-based fertilizer, we uh, concentrate the organic matter content, but also the uh, content of nutrients. So we are, we are no, uh, not uh, a simple product, but we are very uh, complex and technology advanced product. And then the next slide. So to create a, a refined organic-based fertilizer, um, we use a lot of secondary raw material, and you have some example on, on this slide. So we are the key actors on the circular economy because we are revalorizing some waste into um, fertilizing product and to, to be able to close the loop. So we have, and we can use some direct sources like seaweed, plant extract, uh, vegetable cakes, we use also some raw material coming in the livestock, like manures or poultry, uh, guano. We also uh, have uh, some byproduct coming in the slaughterhouses, like fissure meal, bone, blood, meat. We have some products from, from the fish sectors, uh, fish meal, for example. And we use a lot of food and feed processing byproduct. And I put uh, insect for us in this category because uh, uh, you are part of this uh, sector. So as you can see, we have a large variety of uh, secondary raw material and uh, we can say that we close the loop of a lot of uh, different value chain. And I'm going to the next slide, please. Two uh, slide to focus more on uh, insect frass uh, and the possibility for frass to be a raw material for organic based uh, fertilizer. So first of all, uh, I will uh, say something that you know everywhere. Uh, it's uh, innovative raw materials. Uh, you fit with the circular economy and the zero waste approach. Uh, you also develop uh, some process of production, uh, which is sustainable with low environmental impact. Uh, and the natural fertilizer is also suitable for organic farming with a high value for the farmer, like the organic matter content, the possibility also to sequester carbon in the soil. Uh, you, by the quality of the uh, organic matter, you have a, an impact on the soil biodiversity. Uh, also, it's important. And due to the origin of the nutrient, you have a slow release, I, I, if I can say. So the uh, mineralization of the nutrient part is, um, uh, is based on the activity on the soil and we can ensure that the plant have enough nutrient when it's needed and we avoid by this way some uh, risk of leaching of uh, nitrogen or phosphorus, for example. Next slide, please. If we uh, have another perspective, so if we want to sell directly flask as organic fertilizer, so as mentioned by Chloe, flask have a high level of organic matter content, around uh, 70-80%. Due to the fact uh, that uh, the flask is uh, treated uh, by it, uh, we have a high dry matter content, so it's very easy to store and to handle. We have a low risk matter content because it's transformed according to the animal population. We have also, due to the uh, raw material used for the production of insects, a low content of contaminants. And we have a content of nitrogen uh, equivalent than some other uh, manures. So we can use as uh, both sectors, both markets, uh, so agricultural use or home and garden uh, use suitable for organic farming and uh, today there is uh, some authorization obtained in uh, several uh, EU countries. And next slide please since we last one just to to put on perspective uh, the organic based fertilizer and the action to close the loop uh, with the objective of the European Green Deal. So we focus on four main topics. The first one, uh, when we use organic-based fertilizer, we uh, add organic carbon uh, to the soil. So 
we have action on the soil F, mutation change mitigation, biodiversity, but also we uh, are an actors to recycle nutrients uh, and we avoid um, to become a waste. So we act uh, in the circular economy perspective in the farm to fork strategy. We also deliver consistent product formulation to ensure the uh, balance in plant nutrition. So in MAP is the integrate nutrient management action plan. So uh, it's a, a new uh, approach to better uh, use the nutrient and the, adapt to the fertilization with the need of the soil and the plant. We also are an actor and we can be a part of the CAP policy. And we also allow plants to take up nutrients as uh, and when they are needed with the between brackets, the control rules. So uh, I would like to thank you. So it's a next slide, please. So just a conclusion. When you can have more information about ECOFI, uh, you can follow us. And um, I'm very happy to, to participate to this roundtable. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thank you, Benoit. And last but not least, I will come to you, Penelope, um, for your introductory statement. So Penelope, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Penelope Vincent Sweet. You, you, have, you have my slides, don't you? Yeah. Uh, my consultancy is called Sweet by Nature. Uh, I live in France, in Grenoble, and I'm very involved in community composting, a separate collection of bio-waste and anything to do with uh, organic waste. Uh, I work on a volunteer basis for France Nature Environnement as well. Uh, next slide, please. I'm representing the European Environmental Bureau, EEB. Now, EEB we say we are the, the environmental voice of European citizens. We stand for environmental justice, sustainable development and participatory democracy. Our aim is to ensure the EU secures a healthy environment and rich biodiversity for all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're the, the largest network of environmental citizens organizations, uh, around 150 civil society organizations from all over Europe, as you can see on this map. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, soil. Soil is a home to a, a, a quarter of the world's biodiversity. It is a, a non-renewable resource. It is all around us, but we ignore it. We could call it dirt, but uh, how can we ignore some uh, 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 environment which <laughs> contains a quarter of the world's biodiversity? A living soil is the farmer's greatest asset and a living soil needs organic matter. Next slide, please. Here's a map representing the level of organic matter in European soils. The darker patches in Northern Europe indicate high, le high levels of organic matter, some of them are peatlands. Uh, but we can see that in Southern Europe, the colors are very pale, meaning that the organic matter content is low. Look at uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, uh, even France, not very dark. Uh, next slide, please. A few years ago, NGOs organized a Europe-wide campaign, People for Soil, to raise awareness of the importance of this resource. A healthy soil means a carbon sink of enormous potential, a defense against erosion, improved mechanical and hydrological properties, uh, needing less fertilizers, mineral fertilizers, <clears throat> Uh, which, of course, mineral fertilizers, I think we all know, are very hungry uh, for energy and resources. Uh, re and a, a healthy soil also means reduced loss of nutrients. And this is one of the, the big 
um, focuses of the farm to fork um, policy. The, uh, the loss of the nutrients we lose pollute rivers, they create algal blooms. Next slide, please. So uh, we need to bring organic matter to soil. Uh, it's all part of the circular economy. Clean, non-contaminated organic matter. As leaves fall to the forest floor in a natural cycle, so this clean, non-contaminated organic matter can feed our, our soils. All animals eat and excrete, eat and excrete. The worms in my worm bin work very hard to eat my food scraps and their excreta feed my plants. Now, I don't know how it is with you, but in Grenoble, we have a thriving population of flower moths. Uh, and I have no hesitation in pouring into my compost bin the droppings in the jar of seeds I forgot at the back of my cupboard um, because the flower moths ate all, my, all the seeds. Now, uh, one could think maybe I'm going to um, produce an enormous a colony of flower moths out in my garden. But no, if you have some biological knowledge, you know that uh, insects don't live outside their particular environment. And so there are so many um, competing insects outside in the garden or in my compost heap, that there's no way that the flower moths are going to survive. Um, all right, we are, uh, we are looking at things on a larger scale here. We're looking at uh, the term very much larger populations of insects. Now, I've, in then, I've identified three main issues that need, we need to keep an eye on. I think we've, they've already been mentioned. Introducing exotic species, but I'm told that at the moment they're not used. Uh, disseminating pests and sanitary aspects for the soil ecosystem, for animals, and for humans. Um, I believe the issues are already addressed to a large extent, or, but, but of course there is a lot still to learn. We don't know everything. But safe, safe does not mean sterile. Uh, we have uh, created enormous problems for ourselves by trying to make everything sterile. <clears throat> we have created allergies by bringing up babies in a, an environment without enough dirt. Um, so it appears that insect frost has stimulating effects on soil and the chitin itself from the insect parts appears to have a positive effect on plants. Uh, so I'm a little disappointed that the commission is still insisting on heat treatment of everything that has been there, any kind of animal. But I understand, of course, the need to be cautious. And I understand where they're coming from. It's a, we're working on a European scale. But we need to step out of the hygienist era and understand that microorganisms are more often our allies than our enemies. The, the fertilizing products regulation includes biostimulants as a fertilizing product. And uh, I think this is positive. There's a last recognition that uh, soil is living, plants need living. Um, uh, there is a, a, a whole ecosystem in soil and in raising plants. We're bringing in the agriculture of the 21st century. This is less reliance on mineral fertilizer, which, uh, um, as I said, yes, uses a lot of energy and resources, and more working with nature. Next slide, please. Uh, it, it isn't easy. I understand there are a lot of difficulties, but from what I've heard today, I do believe we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penelope. Living soil is a farmer's greatest asset. I think you 
summed that up very, very nicely there. Um, so we will now um, have some questions, a little Q&A session. And we have some questions that were already sent to our panelists before the event from various stakeholders, including policy officers, consultants, um, and also farmers themselves. That will follow, we'll also follow that with a, a short Q&A from the audience. So I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Please do keep your questions coming and please do specify um, who you are when you send your question and also who your question is directed to so I can direct that best for you. Um, so let's dive in to the Q&A session. And um, perhaps Johanna, I will come to you first. I mean, we've just heard um, here from Penelope, this need to step out of the hygienist era, I think is the way she put it, and um, sterile not always being safe. I, I wondered what your response to that is. Um, yes, I can only talk, uh, I cannot really talk about uh, agricultural practices because that's not my specialty, that's the specialty of my colleagues in uh, DG Agri mainly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can talk about uh, products that uh, we want to uh, facilitate free movement uh, for uh, on the on the um, on the single market uh, of the EU. Uh, so I come back to my to to fertil to the fertilizing products regulation now because it's fertilizers that uh, that we are talking about. And there it's really about um, uh, supporting the green transition of the industry. Uh, it's really about supporting the green transition of, of uh, manufacturing industry. So uh, towards uh, lower, lower carbon intensive products indeed, uh, and also much more circular products. And I'm well aware, I mean, Penelope and I, she's, she's a very, very valuable contributor to our discussions in the fertilizing products expert group, uh, as it is. Uh, and I'm very well aware of her point that uh, we need to, uh, we cannot exclude um, living uh, materials from, from uh, agricultural practices. Um, and the angle from which, and this is certainly not our intention either, but the angle from which I come uh, with, again, FPR, which is a product regulation is really to facilitate the green transformation of the industry. Uh, you know, maybe we will continue needing mineral fertilizers, but at least they shouldn't be mined. They can be mineral, but they should be uh, derived from, from urban mining, uh, from recovered phosphorus. Uh, and if you remember on, on one of my slides, I said uh, there are very interesting business opportunities for uh, manufacturers of, uh, of fertilizers, but also for technology providers who, uh, who are willing to jump on the train and uh, provide these technologies to uh, manufacture industrial products in, in a sustainable way. So I would say there's, there's, not, there's not a conflict here. Uh, and the, from, from our level, we certainly don't want to meddle into agricultural practices, but we want to facilitate the transformation of, of, uh, of the industry and manufacturing of products that, remember, will circulate widely and can remain in storage for, for a very long time and that are not controlled in the meantime. That's where mm -hmm. I come from. Okay, and talking about facilitating this transition, as you said, I mean, Penelope mentioned um, in her introductory statement, the farm to fork strategy. Um, I actually have a question here from someone uh, uh, that came prior to the event from, um, from Jane. I think Jane's a consultant. Um, and she would like, uh, like to know, in your opinion, Johanna, um, are the farm to fork, uh, so the farm to fork, the EU's flagship food policy, are the farm to fork targets to reduce nutrient losses by at least 50% and the use of fertilizers by 20% realistic, in your opinion? Perhaps you could come in on that question. Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, and on behalf of the Commission, I have to believe that they are realistic because otherwise the Commission shouldn't have defined them. Uh, I, I want to say I think they really go hand in hand because with reduced leakage, uh, of course, you can also use less. So, so the targets really go hand in hand and they support each other. Uh, and again, we see so much uh, innovation and uh, appetite for, for development uh, in this world. Uh, we talked about, I mean, uh, Benoit, I think, mentioned uh, the fact that uh, organic uh, fertilizers leach less. They are slow release. They are natural slow release. We don't, maybe we don't even need polymers uh, or coatings to achieve slow release fertilizers. Maybe we can just uh, use more organic material and then uh, we will automatically have a slower re release of, of the nitrogen and the, and the phosphorus. Um, and we also, and somebody, I can't remember who, but somebody also mentioned plant biostimulants. I, I think it was Penelope. And there we also see an enormous interest from, from the market. Uh, they 
they, they were they were the, the the plant biostimulants industry was perhaps the, the, the biggest fan of the FPR because finally uh, there would be a recognition and there would be a free movement on the uh, on the single market of plant biostimulants and as far as we can judge this really has helped to to uh, explode the 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 industry uh, they, they they are uh, there's a very keen interest and and of course the the uh, the main purpose of uh, plant biostimulants is to increase precisely uh, nutrient uh, efficiency which will reduce both the leakage and and the consumption so uh, so yes we we're definitely working uh, towards those targets Thank you. Great to hear that optimism there. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to um, Benoit for a couple of questions that we have here um, for you. So um, we have a question here from Paolo, um, who is a marketing manager. Um, Paolo would like to know um, whether in EcoFee's uh, opinion, oh sorry, EcoFee's view, um, which are the main target crops, uh, you know, for example, cereals or oil seeds, things like that, um, for organic fertilizer producers across the EU? And does this depend, you know, depending on the region, kind of climatic conditions? Ah, very interesting question, because uh, today and until now, um, organic-based fertilizer are more used in specialized crops food production, orchard, and so on. But uh, with the uh, development of organic uh, farming rules, so the production uh, on organic uh, farming, we have also uh, more and more requests to have uh, the organic based fertilizer are uh, part of the plant of fertilization of uh, arable crops like wheat, corn, and so on. But uh, we also uh, note that um, the change and the regulation like nitrate directive, for example, um, is a good support to, to, to use more organic-based fertilizer in arable crops. And uh, as uh, said Penelope, the soil biodiversity, the soil F, um, I will say, is also a good uh, opportunity for organic based fertilizer to, to use in different sectors because now farmers, citizens, European citizens, have more uh, knowledge about the poor quality of the soil in some area and they want, it will be very difficult to, to regenerate soil but to limit mm. the, the loss of biodiversity and by adding uh, organic carbon in the soil we act at all level, but it will take time to recover the quality of the soil uh, to, to have a better soil F and by this way, limit the risk of pollution and so on. So I will say, I think tomorrow, organic-based fertilizer will be used in all types of crops, but also um, we have more and more use in uh, OB market. So as uh, as you can uh, do in your garden, uh, we use more and more organic uh, fertilizer, and and uh, it's not the, the, the case today in Europe. But uh, I heard uh, some weeks ago that the Sri, Sri Lanka uh, decided to ban all chemical fertilizer and will impose only organic fertilizer. So it's a main decision for a country to to convert uh, the mineral fertilizer into organic fertilizer. So it, it's a good way, it's a good uh, achievement uh, and to take more uh, care about the quality of the soil and the planet. So I will not say that tomorrow we'll, we'll ask the commission to convert <laughs> all mineral into organic fertilizer because it, it will be very difficult and we, we must be frank, it's impossible to replace all quantity of mineral fertilizer by organic sources because we don't have enough uh, raw material. So FRAS could be an opportunity, but we will not be able to, to satisfy all the need of the plant by converting and reusing organic sources. So we have to mm -hmm. find the right balance between mineral fertilizer, organic fertilizer, and uh, try to avoid the, the waste of uh, organic sources. Definitely rather ambitious <laughs> to, to ban all of it. Um, but taking into account your answer here, um, so do you have an opinion, maybe which crops do you see that, that insect frass specifically um, could, uh, could help kind of improve the performance the most as a fertilizing product? 
I think we 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 have no specific type of crops because uh, uh, the organic fertilizers or frass could be used uh, in all uh, different uh, type of uh, crops. It depends of the needs of the farmers, the quality of the soil. Um, so I will say it depends. I, I think uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow probably. Um, due to uh, the quality of the frass, this kind of product will be more um, used in some specific market with a high value. I, I think, for example, frass could be uh, a good support for the marketing of some uh, producer of wine, for example, in Champagne or in Bourgogne. People would like to use a new innovative fertilizer with uh, the approve the, of the circular economy and so on. So probably this kind of fast could be more valorized in this uh, specific crops, for example. But, but we know that today in some arable crops under uh, specific and private rules, uh, probably fast will be used to guarantee the traceability of uh, the raw material, the two level of contaminants inside the product and so on. So for me, tomorrow, fast could be used for all type of crops. Okay, excellent, kind of broad, broad spectrum. Um, so I'm gonna bring Penelope back in here for the next question. We have a question for you, Penelope, um, from Albert, who is a researcher, um, and he points out that the insects are already a natural component of the soil trophic web, um, and their fast, you know, plays this role in providing plants with nutrients. Um, Albert would like to know your opinion on whether using insect frass as a fertilizer, in doing so, could we copy and kind of mimic what happens in nature there? What's your opinion then? Well, well, yes, of course, but there are so many things that happen in nature. Some are beneficial, some are not. Um, so it's very hard to give a general answer to that. But it's clear that if you see what happens in soil, in the soil ecosystem, you have different bacteria, fungi, small insects, larger insects, uh, worms. Uh, all of this, this enormous population is interacting. And, um, and, and by better understanding what's going on, and, and harnessing things. What, what we do as farmers is to, to push, uh, push the balance in our favor. All right, we've pushed it so hard uh, that, that uh, we've, we've almost lost um, the, uh, the, the tools that we need <clears throat> to produce because sometimes we have almost killed our soils. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we need to find a way to, um, to push more gently and to understand and to bring in the soil, the microorganisms and other, other uh, uh, living, um, uh, living organisms and, and other things that can help us to, to, to produce better, respecting, respecting the tool we use to produce, which is the soil. Mm, so striking that balance between. Um, definitely. Let me also now bring in Chloe. I have, I have a question for you here, Chloe, uh, from Nico, who, who is an entre entrepreneur. Um, and Nico would like to know about the possibilities and benefits for plants um, you know, in mixing insect frass and also a mineral fertilizer, maybe in the same kind of application. I mean, what, what, would, you, what would you say what the benefits might, of that might be? Um, so I think it's, it's good to see also these different types of fertilizer complementary and uh, as uh, Benoit uh, stressed, um, organic fertilizer are not going to replace all mineral fertilizer uh, in, in the near future. Um, the, the top of my head when I think about mixing mineral fertilizer and uh, insect frass or organic fertilizer uh, uh, more generally. Um, I, I think uh, with org organic fertilizer and the frass more specifically, it has impact on soil health more in the long term, uh, being able to uh, boost living soils, while with mineral fertilizer, you have more of a boost effect in the, in the, in the short term and uh, no, uh, not boosting uh, and rather perhaps the opposite, the, the, so, the health of the soil uh, 
specifically. So I think those could be like uh, to um, uh, like mineral fertilizer for short term and uh, insect frost for more uh, longer term uh, mm. soil health. That's quite interesting talking about the different time frames um, of, of that. Um, okay, I think maybe let's now go to our Slido to have a little look at the questions that have come in um, from our audience and we'll see um, what they have for you. Um, so let's get that up now. Okay, we've got, a, we've got one there with a lot, of, a lot of folks at the top there. Let's take that one. Um, so we have here um, Olale VR from Videct. Okay, so to Chloe, this one's for you. How will the thermal treating considered now, so that's between 70, uh, sorry, 60 and 70 degrees, um, affect all the beneficial bacteria in FRAS? So studies are still like in process, like as we said, just new ingredients and new uh, products. So studies are still in process like uh, on this. Um, so far, what we've seen um, is that uh, we are able to maintain most of the beneficial bacteria with the thermal treatment, uh, which is uh, which is great. Um, but we do not necessarily require this thermal treatment to uh, ensure uh, that we're compliant uh, in terms of uh, microbiological risk, for instance. Um, and so uh, when we compare with other types of uh, fertilizer, um, that's uh, where there's not necessarily this need of having uh, uh, this uh, long thermal treatments. Um, I think it's, a, it's also a question of whether it has an impact on, uh, uh, on beneficial bacteria, but also whether or not it's, uh, it's required uh, in, 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 in order to mitigate uh, all microbiological risk. And at the moment, what uh, is demonstrating by doing the analysis on uh, the, the, the FRAS, um, even pre-thermal treatment, uh, is that it's not required to cure all the pathogens. Mm. Okay, interesting. Let's have a look at the some other questions. We have one at the top here that also has quite a lot of, uh, of votes um, from um, Sears Roskam from ProEnto. Um, so Sears would like to know when the, so I, he didn't specify who this was to, so let me just have a, uh, we'll see who wants to come in on this. When the frass is used uh, to produce biogas, they assume therm thermal treatment will not be necessary. Perhaps, Chloe, you'd also like to come in on that point. Sure. Um, so uh, in terms of biogas, it's uh, very much depends on, uh, on a country by country basis, um, often also because the methanization occurs uh, close to the, the, the production sites of, uh, of RAS. Um, and it's, uh, they are, there is no level play level playing field on this. There are some countries uh, where uh, thermal treatment is not required, so hygienization process, uh, process, but there are other countries, such as France, uh, where a thermal treatment is uh, for the moment uh, required. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Let's have a look. Where, where do we see here? Uh, yeah, we'll take that question on bacterial colonization from Braden. Let's have a look. Braden Cohen from Soil Technology. He's a soil technology manager at PreZero US. Um, do you see a similar bacterial colonization post heat treatment than if you use untreated frass? So we're still on this topic of uh, everyone's very interested in in heated treatment. Um, I maybe uh, Benoit would like to come in on this um, instead of Chloe. Benoit, would you would you like to respond to this? Um, yes, I, I can try. Uh, just make a, a comparison with uh, what I know better is a chicken manure because. Uh, Today we use chicken manure and chicken manure is also treated at uh, 70 degrees during one hour, like uh, the treatment for the, for the FAS. Um, we, we know that uh, with this kind of treatment, uh, we uh, kill all pathogens, uh, bacteria and microorganisms, and we keep uh, inside the product the uh, PGPR, the promoting rhizobacteria. So it means that we have uh, some good uh, microorganisms um, after the heat treatment inside the product. And these bacteria, this, this microorganism act as uh, beneficial. So after that, uh, we, I will say we, we have to manage the risk. And the first risk is uh, to spread disease and uh, pathogen in the soil. So that is why it's important to have the, the heat treatment to avoid to spray it. Uh, so for me, the 
bacterial colonization could be similar for the beneficial uh, and the beneficial resist to the e treatment. So, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, one for Penelope here at the top. Let's have a look. Also from CS, um, from CS Roskam from ProEnto. Um, he, he liked your speech. <laughs> He's happy about that. The question is, how do you see fermentation of insect frost and compost teas? Uh, that's an interesting question for you, Penelope. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that. I know there are, there are very interesting uh, effects of compost teas, but that's a very mm -hmm. interesting subject to research into. Um, to, to go to back to the, the yes, <laughs> to go back to the bacterial colonization, there are but there okay. are uh, um, a lot of uh, parallels that when you uh, if you sterilize milk, then the bacterial colonization is much. Uh, can be much um, nastier than if you have mm. pasteurized milk when not all, not everything is killed. Um, it can actually, the, mil the milk may turn, it may, uh, but it, it, it doesn't become pathogenic. So I think mm. there are parallels that um, possibly the 60 to 70 treatment is, uh, is uh, appropriate, but certainly uh, uh, one would want to avoid sterilizing at 120 degrees or something. Okay, definitely an interesting parallel there to be made with um, milk. We'll take one more question and before we move to our closing uh, statement today. Um, okay, to Johanna here. Um, this is from Olalo VR, from VDECT. Um, Johanna, even if the press um, is, is going to be marketed as a fertilizer, um, it should be thermally treated as described in the regulation that he's put there, the 142 from 2011. Um, is, is, maybe you can comment on that one. Yes, absolutely. I just want to take a step back and point out, if it wasn't clear from my presentation, that today uh, no insect trust can be marketed. Uh, under FPR. And even mm -hmm. when FPR becomes applicable next summer, it can also not be marketed. Why? Because it doesn't have endpoints yet under the animal byproducts regulation right. regime. So the first thing mm -hmm. that needs to happen is that, uh, so uh, IPIF will have to, to again go to EFSA and say, uh, please define endpoints for these materials under the animal byproducts regulation. It is only then that it can possibly uh, be uh, uh, be covered by the scope of uh, of the FPR, uh, and I think for compost and digestate, it would already automatically be covered as soon as it gets an endpoint under the animal byproducts regime. Whereas uh, for other types of processing mechanisms, uh, we would have to you would have to come to my colleagues and I and ask for an amendment, which we can do. Huh? We'll ask for an amendment also FPR uh, before mm -hmm. the product before the component material before the ingredients is approved under the FPR because we have the system of, of, of approving uh, ingredients. Um, so this is not for now, uh, but also for the future, yes, uh, compliance with the animal byproducts regime will always be necessary. It will not always be sufficient, but it will always be necessary. Mm -hmm. And talking about endpoints, that's a good point to leave it on. Um, we'll uh, now be wrapping up the conference. Before we do, let me hand the floor over to Andriana Castillas, who is IPIF's incoming president, who will now give a closing speech, reflecting on what we've heard and learned today to bring this event to a close. So thank you to all of our panelists for this interesting discussion. And um, Andriana, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Natasha, for the floor. So, uh, estimate participants, uh, honorable officials from European and national institutions, uh, dear representatives of European stakeholders associations, and of course, dear friends, um, on behalf of IPIF, I wish to thank you for your active participation in today's workshop. Uh, as we hear from the distinguished speakers and panelists, uh, the preservation of uh, soil health and fertility uh, together with its microorganisms and natural components is vital uh, for the agriculture. 
So today, uh, through your participation, the insect farming community from Europe and beyond expresses its commitment uh, to making a bolder contribution on this matter. As mentioned in the, during the event, uh, insect frost in its use as fertilizer uh, could play a key role in improving plants growth and uh, soil, soil health. Um, as insects are already part of uh, soil tropic webs, uh, the application of insect frass on agriculture land is in our view, an opportunity for farmers to get inspired by the natural processes that happen in soil ecosystems. Uh, the land application of insect frass is consistent uh, with the circular economy and organic principles, as it reintroduces valuable materials into the food production chain and offer sustainable solutions to European farmers and, of course, gardeners. Uh, in this regard, uh, we should also remind ourselves about the importance uh, of a circular agriculture in order to reduce pollution and its effects on soil. Uh, this year's EU Green Week theme, Zero Pollution for a Healthier People and Planet, stresses on the importance to rethink about how we farm and how we produce food. And produce food. <clears throat> Soil is one of the greatest natural resources uh, that helps the planet uh, to store carbon and mitigate the harmful impact of greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere. Um, a healthy soil not only helps tackling uh, climate change, uh, but also produce healthy food. So on this subject, the international platform of insects for food and feed remains in close collaboration with the European institutions and in our capacity as representatives of European insect farming, uh, we welcome the recent agreement reached <clears throat> by the EU member states on the implementing regulation that aims at development uh, in the EU level playing field uh, for the use of insect frass on agricultural, uh, agricultural land. So I wish to thank you uh, once again uh, for your participation in today's event. And on behalf of uh, IPIF, um, and it's more than 70 members, I look forward to seeing you uh, very soon in the near future. Thank you very much for today. Thank you very much, Adriana. And with that, that is, that is it from us today. Um, but for more on frass and the potential that insects hold generally as feed and food, be sure to check out um, IPIF's website for more information. And if you want to relive the fun again from today's event, uh, the recording of this event will be made publicly available on IPIF's YouTube channel in the coming days. So that's it, it from us today. I'm Natasha Foote. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you all have a lovely evening enjoying the sunshine. Thank you.